hi everybody um if, if everyone can see me or if they can uh they can uh they're 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 able to hear mustafa and i we probably um, are and i just checked mustafa we are live so it's great and um so my name is sujay tile um and um, i'm going to introduce mustafa in a second and ask him to give a full introduction but this session um is really a q a between myself and mustafa um, I get the, I'm lucky I get to ask the questions. Mustafa has the harder job of answering them, um, you know, about scaling marketplace businesses in emerging markets. And we're very excited about this talk because the two of us have spent a lot of time in emerging markets, building marketplace businesses. And we're lucky enough to be able to work together. Now I recently joined the board of Mustafa's company. He was kind enough to have me. Um, and we think a lot every single day about how do you build launch optimize businesses across the world, particularly Latin America, Africa, Middle East, um, and Asia. Um, prior, to, prior to joining Swivel's board, I was the co-founder and CEO of a company called Frontier Car Group, which built a lot of marketplace businesses in the used car space across 13 different emerging markets. Um, we were headquartered in Berlin, built across LATAM, Africa, and Asia, um, a model to sell cars between consumers and dealers. Um, we were lucky enough to sell the business to Naspers this past December, um, where we integrated it within the OLX team. And now um, that business is growing very nicely alongside the classifieds team of OLX. Um, I'll let Mostafa introduce himself um, in, in two seconds, but I'm just thrilled to have uh, him here to talk about his journey, to talk about Swivel's journey, which I admire. Obviously, I'm a little biased now, but I've admired Prior as probably the leading emerging markets company especially in transportation. Um, so with that, Mustafa, it would be great if you could introduce yourself to everybody and uh, you know, talk about, talk about you, you, your background and, and, uh, and how you got to Swivel. Thank you, Sujay. Really, really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. And thank you so much for the Marketplace Conference team for hosting us. We're truly honored. Uh, so I'm Mustafa Andil. I'm the CEO of Swivel. A bit about my background. I'm an oil and gas engineer. Worked at uh, Rocket Internet in the Philippines and Egypt, was part of their venture development team. Uh, then joined Kareem, which was uh, recently sold to Uber for 3.1 billion, was part of Kareem's expansion team. So my job at Kareem, along with my teammates, was to expand Kareem across the region. Uh, we launched Kareem Turkey, we launched Kareem a few cities in Pakistan, and a few cities in Egypt. And at that time, I was uh, 24, and I thought... Uh, that if I stay at Kareem longer, I'll just get too comfortable and it will be very hard to move on. Uh, and so I decided to quit. And one of the most interesting problems to solve was the problem of mass transit, right? A lot of people have tried to solve for mass transit has been for the longest time limited to governments and has been extremely subsidized, not at the best state of affairs. Uh, and definitely a, a space that's ripe for disruption in a way, right? Moving millions of people and uh, moving kind of the masses across uh, across the world and specifically in emerging markets that struggle the most. And for us, emerging markets presented, or there was a great opportunity for emerging markets to leapfrog in a way, because if you think about it, uh, developed markets, basically, developed nations have went, built public transportation, invested hundreds of millions of dollars, a lot of them are not necessarily very profitable, uh, but they went through this, the, a very, very tough journey until uh, it got to that kind of state of, uh, of, of kind of organization, of operational, of profitability, et cetera, et cetera. But in emerging markets, they already haven't gone through that phase, right? And that means that like FinTech industry, for example, in Kenya, where m -Pesa came and leapfrogged the entire nation from it's a very cash-driven society to a very kind of to, or, a, or a mobile money society and they pretty much skip the card. There's an opportunity for that, all the emerging markets to do exactly the same when it comes to public transport and not necessarily build and become kind of a regulator and the operator in this very weird arrangement. Uh, operating mass transit. So, uh, we were solving a problem for the demand side, which is struggle to find an affordable, reliable, convenient commute, who are torn apart between taking public transport that's very inhumane in a way, very broken, very unorganized, and non-existent even, or I'm taking on-demand transportation like Uber, Kareem, Ola, DB, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to build a mass transit for Medicare. 
class that delivers on affordability, reliability, and convenience. And at the same time, solves a massive problem for the government that invests hundreds of millions of dollars every, uh, every year on subsidizing these very inefficient public transportation systems that employs tens of thousands of employees. Uh, we wanted to build a parallel public transportation system. Uh, so we started out of Cairo, and then we expanded to Alexandria, Nairobi, Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad. So sorry, sorry about the connection issues, everybody. We're back. So so Mustafa, you were, you were explaining kind of the the all the mega cities that you're in, the problems that these economies face. Let, let, let's take kind of a step back on, let's take a place like Cairo, for example, where, where Swivel is big. You know, talk about how prior to Swivel, the regular commuter traffic was done and what options people had. And then yes. also long distance travel. You know, if they needed to yes. go to the city, for example, what, what problems, what, 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 what solutions do they have? And then let's talk about how Swivel applies to both of those two things. Yes, yes, yes. So for before Swivel, basically, if I'm a middle class commuter, uh, I'm a millennial, I work in a corporate or I work or I study in a university, my commute is usually, I have two main options, right? I either take the public bus, which is very, very broken, doesn't try to schedule, barely exists, a bus that just carries 50 people, carries 200 people. Uh, so <laughs> very... Uh, very uh, unsafe as well, especially for women, right? If you're a woman who will take the public transport, you will most likely get harassed in the public transport, which is very, very scary. Or you take on-demand transportation, right? The, you take an Uber, a Kareem, et cetera. So if I make $500 a day, uh, a month, sorry, uh, which is a salary of a doctor or engineer in a city like Cairo, and I have to pay $20 a day just to go to work and come back taking an Uber, and for me, public transport is kind of an inhumane option and pretty much torn apart, right? Like I try one day to pool with friends, one day to take the public bus, one day I take an Uber. I try every day to kind of uh, find a way to commute to work. It's a continuous hassle that I have to navigate every day, basically. Right? And uh, for us, that, that was a great opportunity because there was, uh, the, the, there was basically this huge fleets of very high quality buses that are sitting around uh, very, very underutilized. Buses that work with tour companies, buses that work with in the education sector, with corporates, so on and so forth. These buses are, have two major problems, right? One is severe inefficiency. A lot of them work only twice a day. And, and that means that they basically sit for the rest of the day around, sit around empty, not doing much. And the second was the seasonality aspect of things, right? A lot of them work with very seasonal businesses uh, like schools, which work at best eight months a year, like tour companies work six months a year. So, um, so that means that there was this abundant supply, a very high quality supply that's very underutilized, that's not making enough return on investment, that's commercial supply that's existing in these markets. And there's this huge demand that's struggling every day, uh, uh, that missing kind of a, a public transportation option, right? Right, no, and then so, so that, that's perfect. So, so the, the cost makes total sense that there's this massive opportunity between commuter traffic and a public bus and an Uber, for example, you know, call it $1 for a public bus, 10 bucks for an Uber, there has to be a massive population in the middle. And then for long distance, and there has to be supply that's open, as you talked about. So tell us, tell us about swivels, how they come into the market, and do they directly compete with these, or do they work together with public transportation um, yes. in countries? So we have both models, actually. And, and uh, traditionally, what we do is we don't compete with the public bus, right? Because the public bus has its own customer base, has, has its own... Uh, uh, caters for primarily kind of the very low socioeconomic classes of these emerging markets, right? And middle class is struggling in between, right? They take an Uber, they take a Kareem most of the time, or they take their own cars, right? So effectively, we were not really competing much with the public bus. And the public bus uh, was kind of operating on its own, this kind of monster that's operating on its own. Uh, we were more competing on the other side of things, right? We were competing... Uh, with the Ubers, Kareems, and the on-demand transportation part of the world. And we're taking most of the demand out of them because finally people were able to find uh, the same reliability and convenience, but at one fourth of the price, right? Uh, yeah. So the, it was a no brainer, right? No, it makes, makes sense. Makes, makes total sense. So, I mean, the, the business has been obviously tremendously successful. Um, you guys have raised what, a hundred million dollars in equity now. Um, we'll be doing a big growth round soon. The, People love it. You know, whatever metrics you can share, um, you know, both in terms of where you guys are, where you guys are planning, how it's going in these countries. I think I think just to, to tell the audience, sure. kind of, you know, now we know the solution, what, what's been happening. 
Yes. So yeah, we started three years ago. Uh, we started with uh, three buses at that time. Uh, that was exactly three years ago. We've grown now. We have around 5,000 buses running across eight, mass, uh, eight mega cities, basically. So Cairo, Alexandria, Nairobi, Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, uh, Amman, and Dubai. We moved our headquarters uh, out of Dubai. So we're an Egyptian homegrown, but uh, we're now uh, based in Dubai, uh, which is kind of in the center of the, all the geographies that we're in and the geographies that we're targeting. We raised uh, around $100 million of funding so far. So we're one of the most well-funded startups here in Middle East and Africa. Uh, we do hundreds of thousands of trips every day. So we transport hundreds of thousands of people uh, who commute from one place to the other every day. So we're one of the definitely kind of the biggest uh, bus operator probably in the world and uh, definitely one of the biggest movers of people across the world for sure. Um, we basically, this year for us, 2021, hopefully is a year where we conquer the world, as we say, and you know this. So hopefully end of 2021, we want to be on every continent on the planet uh, with kind of either our retail category or transfer service or intercity categories, one of the three. Yeah. Fantastic. No, absolutely not. We've been stunned to see the progress already. And, um, you know, I, I guess one question we didn't discuss, honestly, but maybe I'll put you on the spot a little bit is, you know, to t- talk about COVID a little bit, talk about COVID and how it's impacted the business, obviously, with with commuter and how you're kind of seeing seeing that come back. And, um, yeah. um, you know, because obviously that's top of mind for a lot of people here. Yes. So actually, COVID, everybody will think that uh, mass transit is, should be massively impacted. Right? And it was definitely. Uh, and I think we're, we're quite lucky that we operate in a, in a space in mass transit uh, that kind of in this sweet spot between the Ubers and Kareem's and the on-demand transportation of the world and the public transport, right? And explain why this is very useful, right? So for us, COVID, when it hit, uh, it was a great opportunity in a way because when you grow super fast, as you know, so Jay, you make a lot of compromises, right? You pick always growth over efficiency and you always say that, okay, at some point I will be able to prioritize efficiency, but now is the time just to grow and pursue growth, right? I want to grow very quickly, create as much barriers to entry as possible, mm-hmm. focus on the experience, focus, focus on the user, right? rather than focusing on the financial metrics of things initially. And, and this has been uh, the case for us, right? And when COVID hit, that was a great opportunity for us because that means that for the first time ever, we can get to sit and actually focus on all of the efficiencies that we wanted to bring to the business. Uh, so we actually took a very kind of a very decisive call very, very quickly into the lockdown. And none of our markets actually was 100% lockdowns. And uh, that's kind of the why emerging markets kind of, it's a bit harder to do this in emerging markets because it's always a choice between, uh, which is very unfortunate, right? Between the certain death of starvation of the daily workers, basically, and the uncertain death of disease, right? So that means that emerging markets cannot really, or doesn't have the ability to completely shut down, right? So the, none of the markets that we're in has totally switched up, but it was a good opportunity for us. We felt one from a social responsibility standpoint, it's still, we don't understand the virus. We don't understand what will be the implications of mass transit. Uh, so it's wise to switch up, but also this is a good opportunity for us to rebuild the business internally. So to focus on how do we network plan? How do we maximize our utilizations? How do we perfect our pricing? So on and so forth, right? So we for that, we managed very quickly to bring down our cost around 20% of what we used to spend without kind of needing to let go of people uh, because our cost was by design very, very variable, right? And because we are in a relatively lower cost uh, kind of a geographies, right? We were able to structure our teams accordingly. And that means that in that in a, in a case like this, we don't have to let go of people, right? Uh, so we took those three months, completely shut down, rebuild the business entirely. But when we bounce back, what we found is that, which was very interesting, is because we are in this in this middle space, as, as I mentioned, that the, if we break down our users, let's say in high value and low value, and high value users are the users who take on-demand transportation as an alternative who are not very price sensitive, uh, who can use Swivel or use Uber or Kareem or so on and so forth. And the low value are kind of users who are more price sensitive, who can use, who use us or the public transport. So what we found is that the low value users basically were able, their, their willingness to spend has increased mm-hmm. because they don't want to get any more in a bus that has 200 people, right? They want to they are willing to pay extra for the safety aspects of things that we are bringing in, given we are putting kind of social distancing goods in place, et cetera, et cetera. And the high value users who are economically impacted, 
they are looking for a cheaper option with the same convenience, right? So in the end, we saw as a very significant surge in our demand, actually. So we're now bouncing back. It's been kind of three, four months since we restarted our operations. And we see uh, already our utilization levels of the vehicles has increased by almost 50%, right? That's amazing. Uh, pre-COVID. Yeah. That's amazing. No, I think, I think we discussed this a lot at the board meeting as, you know, all of the new initiatives and, and, and yeah. the, the kind of V-shaped curve. It's been very exciting to see. Um, and so kudos to the team for that. But let me ask you, I mean, this topic of our chat is really about emerging markets. And so, you know, let me, let me, put you, let me ask you, you know, you've scaled starting with one city in a couple of buses to now, you know, seven or eight ultra cities in the world and um, in some of the most populous geographies in the world. And how, you know, how do you think about emerging markets in terms of its challenges? What are the two biggest challenges you have faced um, when scaling in very, very difficult, fragmented places to build businesses. And, and there's so many. Uh, <laughs> there's so many, as you know, I would love to get your take into this yeah. as well. Uh, I think, uh, to name a few, right? Like, from a galaxy standpoint, how do you deal with, there's no really written rules, right? In most of these markets. Um, a lot of rules are being created as you go. A lot of things you don't know necessarily, or you don't have the clarity that they even exist. And you are kind of you stumble upon, right? Uh, that's one on the regulatory aspect of things and the policy making uh, part of things, which also can be an opportunity if used correctly, right? And the second is you have a, a significant user base, a very very volume heavy market, right? But not necessarily willing to pay. The willingness to pay is not necessarily very high, right? So how do you build a business on top of? And these very, very big volumes that require massive operations, that requires massive scale and massive technology to be able to handle all of these operations, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being able to make money out of a dollar and a half, two dollar kind of trips, right? This is a very tough balance to make, right? How do you balance the economics of a, of a driver, of a, of a customer? How do you make sure that you price everyone correctly uh, to get everyone to actually be able to, in the end, to make money out of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is how do you use technology, right? Uh, to, to be able to do that. And the third is finding talent, right? Uh, and uh, not only finding talent is a problem, but bringing them to emerging markets is a very big problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to hire people in Egypt, there are a lot of great, great people, a lot of great talent. Uh, but if you want to build world-class teams, basically, you want to bring the best of the best from everywhere around the world, even the immigration laws in most of em em emerging markets are very, very hard, right? Like you cannot very easily bring people and just let them live, right? Uh, even if you, if, there's no even clear way to do it, right? In most of these markets. Uh, so finding talent, being able to prevent also when you hire the best of the best, right? You have opportunities globally. You don't really have opportunities only in, in the countries you're in. And that means that you're competing with the Facebooks, Googles of the world for the retention of this talent, right? So how do you provide them with the right set of problems and the challenges that can actually keep them excited, that can keep them motivated to go to work every day? Uh, so for us, just to name a few, those were kind of the three of the top uh, the kind of top problems we have. Add to this, of course, the easiness of finding uh, 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 raising capital out of emerging markets. Right? right. Always viewed as uh, higher risk markets. There's sure. currency risks, et cetera, et cetera, where you have to also give the comfort uh, to the investors, to everyone who who's kind of have to give you kind of money to be, help you grow and build this on a global level. I would okay. love to know from your perspective, yeah. how was it for you? No, I think, I think let, let's, let's start with a couple of them. I mean, team, I think, is, is a really, really important one. I mean, you know, I think these are markets. You know, we, we, at FCG, we were in, you know, places spanning from Mexico, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, all the way to Nigeria, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and uh, with headquarters in Berlin. And so, you know, it was very hiring talent on the ground was, was probably the preeminent thing that you have to do. I, I share your concern. The, um, because at the end of the day, these businesses are so operational that they're built with the best teams on the ground. And so yeah. managing a lot of the operations from Berlin is just impossible. And I think some companies have tried that um, to little success because you have to be on the ground with a savvy team who knows the operations. Um, you know, I, and so, so I, share, I share that concern. So how, how have you, you know, um, the, the trade-off of that though, Mustafa, that I found at least, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts is, how do you create a unified culture? Because yeah. you have, you know, Swivel operating in different places. How do you feel like your team in Islamabad is connected to your team in Cairo, is connected to your team in Dubai, um, you know, all under operating under the same norms of, of, of Swivel? 
Do you, how, how do you think about that? And I think this is actually one of the toughest things to, to do, right? And I don't think there's a silver bullet to it, right? There's no one answer that you say, I can, this is if I'm going to do X and Y and Z, uh, this is how I can keep kind of unified culture, right? I think what, what worked well for us so far is uh, the set of values that you kind of put in place, right? So for us, we believe that we're solving a very, very tough problem, right? And that means that we have to put all our effort, all our time, uh, you have, we have to work like uh, our competition never sleeps in a way, right? And that means that we, everyone has to be a co-founder, right? And uh, we started, when we started Swivel, we didn't really put values in place because we thought that if we really want to solve a very massive problem as this, and if we really believe that everyone who needs to come on board needs to be a co-founder in some way, and I cannot say that and just say, okay, these are the values that we should live by from get-go, right? We need to wait and see what does it really make to, or how does, what does it really take to be able to solve for that? Uh, what, what's common among all of us, among all of the team members in terms of values, what do we believe in, what do we, believe in, what do we stand for? Uh, and what is kind of, what is allowing us to succeed, right? What works or not? Right. And then we came up with our set of principles, right? That uh, we build a constitution around, uh, a constitution where we uh, advocate for, a culture of three things, right? Extreme ambition, uh, people who are extremely hungry, uh, who settle for nothing less than greatness in a way. And second is humility, people who uh, are who understand or mature enough to understand that if we don't work for it, all of us, we will all be disrupted, right? Uh, so we have to work for it all the time, every day, all, all the time, basically. And yeah. three is, while we come from 19 different nationalities, we only speak numbers, right? Uh, there's only one language to, to, be, to speak among all of us. There's one thing that we all understand, which is numbers. So how do we build a culture that's centered around ambition, humility, and, and very, very strong analytical skills and, very, and the ability to take decisions only on one premises, sure. which is numbers, right? And how do we put in place this one source of truth, basically, that everyone uh, can take decisions accordingly, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, it was kind of building a constitution that all of us live by, being able to facilitate as much mobility among countries and uh, bringing people from Pakistan to work in Egypt, bringing people from Egypt to work in Kenya uh, and being able to have all of these ambassadors. Starting every new market with a set of people in one of the existing markets who go and start this market. So they bring the culture, they bring the values, they teach the people what do we stand for and uh, facilitating as many as possible summits among everyone, domain specific summits, leadership specific summits, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to create this homogeneous culture. And last but not least is the ability for the leadership team to continuously spend time across every geography. So we do our monthly, let's say town halls, each monthly town hall from one of the cities that we operate in. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of the cities feel that we're all, that everyone is equal, right? Uh, yeah. Plus, we give stock options to everyone almost inside the entire company. So everyone is incentivized by the same set of, uh, let's say, value, right? Everyone is incentivized to create value for everyone. Yeah. That's amazing. No, I really respect that. And I, I think we only have a couple minutes left. So if anyone has more questions, please put them in the Slido link. Um, the, while, while we accumulate questions, let me ask one final one and I'll turn it over to the questions is, what, what are the future? You, you've talked about expansion throughout the world. You've talked about um, where you want to go? I mean, what's what's the vision here? It's, is it you, and what's the next plan? Is it to raise growth capital and then what do you want to, What do you want to be like? If in one two yes. sentences, like what is Swivel's future goal? And like our vision is or is to leapfrog nations, right? And what I described is that we see that the emerging markets has a great opportunity to leapfrog in a way uh, to um, and we want to do our part in 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 that when it comes to transportation. So that's uh, that's mm -hmm. our vision. And for us, that means that we want to bring Swivel to as many capitals across the world as possible, right? Uh, so for us, immediately, of course, uh, we need people to fund our dreams, right? So we need to raise uh, growth capital uh, that we can go and start building more and more geographies. For us, this year, we hopefully are entering LATAM, we're, on, we're entering Asia. Those are two very tough, very specific geographies that we need to be able to master. Uh, and uh, the plan for us in 2021 is to get to a pace we really are able to launch a city per week almost, right? Awesome. Fantastic. So so the, the questions we have, Mustafa, thanks so much for going through Swivel. Um, 
and hand, and ask, answering my questions is, you know, we have a couple of questions. One is, you know, in in Nairobi, Islam, but one common theme that connects a lot of these places is they're pretty cash based economies, right? People, credit card penetration is low. Um, mobile banking is pretty low as well. Well, depending on the Nairobi is actually an exception to that. But um, how do you handle payment? How do you handle payment yeah. um, in uh, where people are used to handing a dollar bill to the to the taxi or to the bus driver? Um, yes. and to ensure compliance and to ensure good accounting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we try to create uh, systems that basically that puts kind of both the user and the and the and the captain, which is the driver, basically. Uh, both of them kind of to correct each other in a way. So we try to, uh, let's say, create a system where if a customer gives cash to the driver, that automatically the customer gets kind of a notification that he got that the cash is already in his balance, else the customer actually can kind of speak to Swivel, right? And the way we deal with it on the on the driver side of things, on the captain side of things, is that we, we always maintain a certain cash on hand uh, that we owe the driver, right? Uh, so whenever the amount of cash collected uh, approaches or gets close to the threshold of the money that we collected, that we have, that we owe to, to the captain, we always kind of put kind of a direct them to the closest kind of a cash and system, cash and kind of partners, and they have to go and dispose that cash to be able to continue working with us, right? Okay. Else they're not able to. So we always kind of manage it from a, from customer and captain side. We try to create a system where they act as a maker checker in a way, and we try to put systems in place and measures in place that push the driver basically, or we always owe the driver money. So he has to go and dispose the cash for us to be able to continue. Right. Got it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. And then final question here, we'll wrap up. Um, tell us about, talk about regulation. I mean, obviously yeah. Uber, Kareem, everyone is highly regulated in some cities, you know, they're operating kind of outside the law. Um, have you run into issues where you've been shut down or in other, does that yeah. include certain markets for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are actually uh, two things to it, right? There, one is in countries that operate massive transit systems that are very inefficient. In these countries, they view us as a savior in a way, right? They, 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 they see that we're lifting this huge burden on the shoulders. Uh, uh, countries like Egypt, like Jordan, uh, like Pakistan, and they actually do everything they can to actually support us, right? Uh, so we, for example, we managed to strike a deal with the Egyptian government. They helped us facilitate this deal where we, mm -hmm. every driver basically works on Swivel can get very low interest uh, loans basically to buy buses to put them on Swivel, right? Uh, they tried to create uh, a very accommodating kind of uh, uh, legislations to be able to let Swivel actually prosper, right? And that has been great. Uh, and that works on companies that suffer from that problem that want actually private players to come and operate and do that on their behalf. But there are other countries like Kenya, for example, which public transportation is actually, there's no government-owned public transportation. has been decentralized, uh, privately owned for the longest time, right? And that means that we are stepping on a lot of toes, right? When we come into a country like Kenya, we're actually competition to the existing kind of uh, uh, players, right? And that means that we had to find a way where we both include kind of all of the, the private operators uh, who kind of thought of us as a threat in some in some way and explain to them how we're actually tapping into a completely different uh, part of the society, how actually we can help them create a new market and take market share from on-demand transportation of whatever on-demand transportation is taken from them, but also go to the policymakers and explain how can we uh, bring transparency uh, to the entire system, right? And uh, and I think we were quite successful on, on both sides. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Mustafa, I think we're out of time here. And so... Uh... This is great, but I, uh, I think we have, we could have talked for another hour, but um, the, um, anyone obviously welcome to reach out. Uh, I think Mustafa is just mk at swivel.com. I'm Sujay uh, Tyler, or Sujay at frontiercargroup.com. Um, reach out. Thank you. Great to speak to you, Mr. Sujay, always. Take yeah. care, man. All right.